Good evening. Jim Wickenkamp is in the house tonight, everybody. There he is, coming to see. Jim, you're on, we're on week five, so it's the last week, but hope you can, hope you can catch up. Hope you can catch up, man. Um, it's been a good week. So since Jim has missed the first four, he's missed all the first three chapters, we need to bring Jim up to speed. So at your table, talk about uh, things you remember. And don't be afraid to move out of chapter four. You can flip back on page in your Bible and look at the different things that we've been talking about. Talk about at your table some of the things. Try to, try to come up with at least two things you remember, and then I'll call on some tables. It's time to talk about what we learned. Remember, Jim has never been to a church before. So this is Jim's first time. You know, it's been a while for Jim. Uh, so when we, when we talk, make sure we explain in, in detail for him. So let's start here. Do what? <laughs> he, he's used to either King James or the Kids Study Bible. So uh, this table, let's start at this table. What are some things you remember from what we've been studying the past few weeks? And you guys have been here every, well, all but one week. You were online one week, though. So you, you, you know some stuff. I know you do. Right. Oh, the historical context of the letter? Yeah. Yeah. Really brings the, the, the letter to life, doesn't it, knowing the historical context? Yeah. What are some things you remember from the historical context? Yeah, yeah, Spirit led him to Macedonia. He wanted to go to Asia, but Spirit, Jesus is what Acts said, kept him. And then they went to Macedonia because there was a, a man in his vision. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Uh-oh, there they are. The stars of the class. There they are. I love it. We, nope, nope. Test is coming, don't you worry. Test is coming. Anything else from this table we want to share? All right, we'll move on. This table. What are some of the things you guys remember from our study? Hmm. Yeah. Right. Actually, Philippians 4, that's a big part of this letter, contentment in his, in his current situation. And in any situation we find ourselves, really. Anything else from this table? A lot of exhortation, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this... Chapter 4, the start will be the, even the, the closest thing we get to it, and it's really an exhortation. It's not even the, much of a rebuke. It's really, really interesting. Appreciate you bringing that up. All right, from the teacher table. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> it is open book. Yeah. <laughs>
Right, suffering is a part of this letter. It's also in Philippians 1, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's two times that he, uh, Paul mentions that. It's very interesting. Yeah, we avoid suffering at all costs. And uh, f- the church in Philippi is called to embrace suffering. So that's a great insight, Georgia. Ms. Jody? Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good Clive Staples Lewis quote right there. Yeah. All right, this table. Hope you guys have caught Jim up so far. And uh, Ricky, no deferring to Dan this time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Dan. What do you got? Right, even in a even in a prison cell, strapped to or uh, chained to a prison guard, you know the Praetorian guard. I think it's very interesting. Actually, in the very end of the this chapter, I think there's some indication that he might have some success there. Come back to you, Jim. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what about this table, husband and wife duo? What'd you guys learn? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We see it again in this chapter. This chapter is so, he cares so deeply for these people. You caught up, Jim? (laughs) Well, you can listen to the podcast. You should have been taking notes. What about you two? You guys think you can come in late because you're saving kids and stuff. But uh, what have you guys learned from this, from our study? Yeah, it was a good letter. It really is. I appreciate you bringing that up, Mary. Also, Mary's birthday was this week, guys, right? On Sunday? 29. That's right. We're about the same age. I love it. In another year, I'll catch you. That's right. Well, all right. Thank you guys for sharing off the top. Um, We're going to, if you don't have the notes, they're back there at the back. But this has been a very uh, consistent group of people. So I know you know the rhythm. You know that there's notes back there. I'm sure all of you have gotten them. We'll we'll start with some review, and then we'll pray, and then we'll jump into Philippians chapter 4. This is the last week, by the way. So make sure you get all the blanks filled in, because there's no coming back. All right, once we leave here tonight, we're done. So, from the top, uh, the first blank, Paul started the church in Philippi how many years before he wrote this letter, Ricky? Ten years. Ricky reminded us of that. The story of that is in Acts chapter 16. The church in Philippi was a major supporter of Paul's ministry, uh, certainly prayer, and also we know financially. This letter is filled with affection and gratitude. Like was stated, he loves this, this group of believers. And he is grateful for them. Paul was writing this letter from house arrest in Rome. House arrest. He was chained on a rotating basis to different members of the Praetorian Guard. And although prison is not Paul's ideal place for ministry, he is making the most of this opportunity to preach the gospel, isn't he, Dan? Specifically to the palace guard or Praetorian Guard. 
same thing. Two ways to, to name them. Paul's actions have emboldened the church in Rome. Remember, there are Christians in Rome, and they have seen the way that Paul has been ministering in one of the most hostile places to proclaim the gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God, in the hometown of Caesar. But Paul's actions have emboldened the church in Rome to dare greatly to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Paul has encouraged the Philippian church to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the Lord or the gospel in the midst of their suffering. Roberta, how are you doing? You missed the test. Everybody else got 100%. We'll see how you do. <laughs> You're going to show them up. I like it. I like it. Oh, man. Very good. All right, so we're all caught up, we're all reviewed, ready to jump into chapter 4. Let's pray before we begin. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this letter, we're grateful for Paul, we're grateful for the church in Philippi, the uh, forerunners in the faith who have set such a great example, and just like uh, Mary was talking about earlier, man, such a great example for us to uh, embody, um, to reject materialism or greed, or to think we need to uh, be content in ourselves and what we can provide for ourselves, but to be content in Jesus no matter the circumstance. Even what Dan was talking about, and being able to proclaim God's goodness, your goodness and your grace no matter the situation, whether we're free to do what we want to do or if we are imprisoned for our faith. <coughs> <There's> <coughs> there is such great uh, wisdom in this letter and encouragement in this letter. And we recognize that uh, the same Holy Spirit that was with Paul in the writing of this letter is here with us tonight in the study of this letter. So Holy Spirit, illuminate uh, the truths of eternity for us tonight. Uh, and may this be for God's glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Excuse me on that cough. My apologies, but we are starting in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. Paul puts, well, somebody else puts pen to paper, but Paul begins to speak. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, I want you to notice what was brought up earlier in our review, the care for this group of people. He loves them. Those whom I love and long for. Long for is a term of anguish. I yearn to be with you again is, is what he mentioned earlier in the letter. He also calls them my joy and my crown. The word he uses there for crown is the same crown that an athlete would get for competing and winning in his or her event. In Paul's event, his only mission in life is to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples. And he says that they are his trophy, his athlete's crown for his hard work in proclaiming the gospel. They are his joy and they are his trophy. And so he encourages to stand firm in the Lord in this way. You'll see two different sections there in that first verse that are highlighted. My brothers and sisters, and then also toward the end, dear friends. This is the same word in the Greek. This is a word that means my beloved. And he uses it twice. A commentator noted on this. I'm actually going to read two different commentators' notes just to emphasize his love for them. This is the first commentator. So much does this relational concern matter to Paul that he repeats Awkwardly from the perspective of grammar, but effectively from the perspective of relationship, the vocative beloved at the end of the imperative. In any other letter, one might think he was trying too hard. But here, in returning to think about them more specifically, he simply cannot stop the flood of affectionate terms that characterizes his feelings toward them. He loves these people. The second commentator said, he piles up five terms of endearment to describe his close relationship with them. My brothers and sisters, beloved, longed for, my joy and crown, and beloved. Paul often addresses all the members of the Christian community as brothers and sisters, but here he does so twice as beloved. Beloved. He loves this church. Some of the notes here to fill in. The church in Philippi is family to Paul. This is not the first time he has used, and I don't think it'll be the last time he will use, brothers and sisters. The church in Philippi is deeply loved by Paul. Deeply loved by Paul. 
The church in Philippi is Paul's treasure, his joy and his crown. The same way that I used to hang my medals and stand up my trophies in my bedroom from all the baseball tournaments and wrestling tournaments and I would just admire them with great pride. This is the way that Paul looks at, looks at the church in Philippi. Why are you laughing, Dan? You don't think I want any medals, man? Come on. I have so many participation medals, it's not even funny. <laughs> Only in wrestling, man. I was, I was on a good baseball team, so they won it for me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, Jody, when you need to kick somebody out of class, what do you do? How do I do? <laughs> I've never done that before. <laughs> exactly. That's true. You know, exactly. <laughs> the last one there. No, uh, the church in Philippi is to remain in Jesus no matter what comes. Note the connection there to Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. I'll read it for us because I did not put it on your paper for some reason. Paul writes in first, or Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. He loves these people. We have mentioned too, I mean, Isaac Murphy is not with us tonight. He was the very first week, he was wondering, where's the, where's the fight in Philippians? Where's the rebuke? I was going to bring this up today for him, you know. Philippians 4 verses 2 and 3, the closest thing we get to a rebuke, and I wouldn't even really call it a rebuke, I would call it an exhortation, an act of love. He says this, I plead, this is another language of longing or anguish. I plead with you, Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. I'll go through a couple of notes here first before I make other comments. Euodia and Syntyche are Greek names. Remember, Philippi was a Roman colony. It was called Little Rome. But before it was a Roman colony, before it had been settled by Rome, it was settled by Philip of Macedon. It was Greek. These are, these people are either traveling merchants or, uh, I don't know if this is exactly the right way to say it, leftovers from the Greek uh, settlement there. Remember, Lydia is also a Greek woman, this is the first person that we meet in the book of Acts chapter 16 when Paul goes to Philippi. Euodia and Syntyche are Greek names because Philippi was a Roman colony. Their Greek names might indicate that they are foreign merchants like Lydia. Another possibility is they are part of the settlement from when Macedon was in control of the region. Was in control of the region. The next blank, notice the status that women had in the early church. We can't look at these two verses of scripture and think, wow, two women just getting in a cat fight. That's not at all what Paul is bringing to the mind of the, the people reading or hearing this letter. He says, these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. These are Paul's co-workers in Christ, just like Lydia who was the matriarch of the church there in Philippi. Notice the status that women had in the early church. This is atypical for women in that era in any landscape of history. Jesus and the church leaders were elevating the status of women within society. Remember, because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, neither slave or free, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But all are in Christ, and Christ is in all. These people are citizens of heaven. No one lords authority over another person. Male and female are entitled to the same value. And and Paul and other church leaders value them as well. They are here to to settle the dispute because they are citizens of heaven. This is language we talked about in Philippians chapter 3 last week. Citizens of heaven. Be of the same mind, the phrase Paul uses is, in the Lord. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ. This should take us back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I know I went a little fast through those blanks. Any questions or uh, make-ups on uh, any of those? We good? All right. 
Let me read that whole, those two verses again and then make some more comments on this. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Synthache. Remember, look at the, I, I'm sorry, not remember, but look. I plead with Yodi and I plead with Syntyche. He's not putting one person at fault. They are both exhorted uh, by Paul to, in the, in the Lord, come together and settle whatever is going on. They are to be of the same mind in the Lord. This language is to say, get together and work this out together. It is of equal responsibility to each of you to be united to one another. We don't know exactly what the situation is is, but we know that the situation is known to the church in Philippi, or I should at least say we can assume that the situation is known to the church in Philippi because it is absent for us. It's likely that Paul doesn't mention what the situation is because everybody in the church probably would have known what the situation was between Euodia and Syntyche. And then Paul writes in verse 3, yes, and I ask you, my true companion Some people think that word, my true companion, is actually someone's name, like someone would be named truth or friend. I don't think that's the case. Most people don't think that's the case. I think this person is probably an elder or a deacon or an overseer in the church there in Philippi. And Paul is appealing to whomever this is, probably known to the community, maybe their senior minister of sorts, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now you might be thinking, man, what a raw deal for these two women to be called out by Paul. Like this letter was going so well for everybody, you know? Like Epaphroditus was getting big praise, everybody was, you know, Paul was talking well about our community, and then here are these two ladies, and they just get kind of like, hey, you know, figure it out. But what What is interesting when you look at letters of antiquity, when writers want to um, put blemish or blame on the name of someone else, they simply won't mention them. They'll leave them out of the letter. And you might be thinking, that's interesting. Well, if everybody knows what's already going on and you simply address, you think about when Paul in 1 Corinthians um, 5, I think he is intentionally trying to shame Shame to bring about a, a, an aspect of realizing that this is sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is when Paul uh, rebukes the church in Corinth about the son sleeping with his mom, right? Yes, it's, yeah, it's a really weird situation, right? It's a shameful, sinful situation. No names are mentioned there. But everybody would have known what was going on in that community. How writers in antiquity would have written that 1 Corinthians 5 would have been written in a way to shame those people, in a sense to repent of their sin. How he writes here in Philippians, by mentioning their names, he gives them status. Remember, women in antiquity were often not even mentioned by their name because their name didn't matter because a lot of people didn't think they mattered. Paul says their names because they do matter. They are citizens of heaven, co-workers in the gospel. Their names are written in the book of life, so he mentions them. He doesn't say anything about their names being wiped from the book of life or anything like that. A commentator said this, For the Pauline letters, this is a remarkable moment indeed. Since Paul does hear what he seldom does elsewhere in conflict settings, he names names. I thought this was interesting. In a media-saturated culture like ours, where naming the guilty or the grand is a way of life. We shame people all the time. It is hard for us to sense how extraordinary this moment is. Apart from greetings and the occasional mention of his co-workers or envoys, Paul rarely mentions anyone by name. But here he does, and not because Yodi and Syntyche are the bad ones who need to be singled out. Precisely the opposite. Here are longtime friends and co-workers, leaders in this believing community in Philippi who have fallen on bad times, like we all do, right? And in terms of their doing the gospel. That he names them at all is evidence of friendship. Since one of the marks of enmity in polemical letters is that enemies are often left unnamed, thus denigrated by anonymity. Another commentator says, but details elude us precisely because they knew exactly what the issue was, which is why we do not. Paul did not have to reiterate in their hearing what was already known in this regard. The issue was known. And Paul knows who's at the center of this issue, and those people's names are written in the book of life, so he mentions them and calls them toward heavenly living. Heavenly living. 
All right, we only have three verses down so far. We got 20 more to go. We got to run. You know what I'm saying? The finish line is upon us, Jack. The finish line is upon us. Any questions, though? Anything uh, right there? All right. Doing good, Roberta? Okay, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentle, whoa. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I need to press pause. I'm going to start over on reading this. We're going to go through a boom, 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 boom kind of movement through these next five verses. Paul is going, if you didn't study the first four, uh, three chapters of Philippians like Jim, you wouldn't understand what Paul's talking about, right? But because we studied the first three chapters, you're going to notice that all of these commands that seem rapid fire are going to connect with something he has already said in the letter. There will be five imperatives or commands here in these five verses, and they will connect to the grander themes of the letter. And Jim, I know you understand the gospel, dude. You know this so well. It's an honor to have you on our last night of class. I bet you regret coming, don't you? <laughs> All right, let's start over. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition. Uh-oh, we must have had a page change. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. All right, Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Starts off with the word rejoice. Rejoice. Now, I see this in this letter. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, or I'm sorry, verses 3. And four, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. This is a letter of joy. And he is calling them to rejoice no matter the circumstances. No matter the circumstances. What's Paul's circumstance in the pinning of this letter? House arrest, prison. And we don't know the details of the Philippian situation, but we know that they are undergoing persecution or sufferings of some kind. And he has already called them in chapter 1 to endure and to remain in Christ in this. And he says it again, rejoice. And the key phrase there when it comes to rejoicing is in the Lord. When you're rejoicing in the Lord and not in your circumstances. Mary, this is what you were talking about earlier. When you're rejoicing in the Lord and not in your sickness or in your pain or in your poverty or in your brokenness, you can rejoice not because of those things but because of the Lord and that you are found in Him. So whether hardship is coming from internal or external forces, you can rejoice because you're not rejoicing in your situation. You're rejoicing in the Lord despite your situation. Whether riches or poverty, you can rejoice in the Lord. Riches or poverty, yes, in the financial sense, but in the mental sense, emotional sense, any sense, you can rejoice. And this is his exhortation to them. Gratitude is the expression of this letter, but rejoicing is the exhortation of this letter. Rejoice. Verse 5, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That gentleness is almost a word that means let your humanity be evident to all. Let your simplicity be evident to all. Think Philippians chapter 2, descend the ladder. Christ who was God became flesh and dwelt among us to become our servant and he died a death on a cross. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Your simplicity be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let's talk about the great 
witness of God, God's presence. Philippians chapter 2 is a testament to God's presence in that Christ became man. We think about the witness of God in throughout Scripture, in the garden. We see the phrase that God walked among Adam and Eve. He was with them in the garden. And even in their rebellion, when God kicked them out of the garden, we see in the Psalms that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, people who need him. And Christ says in Matthew 28, before he ascends, I am with you always. The Holy Spirit is sent and lives inside of the believer. In eternity, we get the promise in Revelation. And we think of Revelation 20, 21, I will be with them and I will be their God. This is the great witness of God. And Paul reminds the church there in Philippians that the Lord is near. In a prison cell and suffering, he is near. Because he came flesh, became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Is written by a man who is currently chained to a Roman soldier. Awaiting trial that may lead to his death. Do not be anxious about anything. How can we live a life of struggle and suffering and not be anxious? I mean, the way in which we respond In the Western world, in America, when anxiety arises, we get to the problem of, I will fix it myself. I will buy something to solve it. I will talk to somebody to solve it. And when I say talk to somebody, we don't always go to God. We usually go to a a buddy that we know that can fix a problem for us, right? Paul says, when you're anxious, go to God in every situation by prayer and petition. This is a weird phrase. With thanksgiving. I wonder how many times Paul thanked God for those chains that were on his hands and his ankles. I don't know how many times, but I'm sure, I'm confident that he did. He says, present your request to God. And when this is the action that you take, the result of this prayer and petition and presenting requests to God, this is what will happen in verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, we can't explain it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. (laughs) I loved what this commentator said. He gave great imagery to this situation. When prayer replaces worry, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, comes in and that peace acts as a sentry guarding the Christian's mind and emotions from being overwhelmed by the sudden onrush of fear or anxiety or temptation. You, you know this in your own life, don't you? When pain comes, when struggle comes, when an unfair situation or an undelightful situation comes, there are feelings in our heart and in our mind that arise within us that we don't want to be there. Fear, anxiety, maybe a, a desire to succumb to whatever the temptation we're facing is. But Paul writes and he exhorts the church here in Philippi to pray because when we pray, we know that God is near us and we know that he will guard our hearts and minds. The imagery here is of a soldier guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus with the peace of God. Maybe it's the Prince of Peace himself. But this is God's promise which transcends all understanding. And even though it transcends our understanding, it doesn't mean that it's not real. I've been really encouraged by these uh, podcasts that I've been recording of different missions partners. A month ago, I was in Barbados, and I recorded a bunch of testimonies from uh, several people at one of the churches there in Barbados. In Barbados, this community in which the church is situated is a fairly impoverished community. And there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of drug addiction. There's a lot, a lot of issues that are going on. And I spoke to a mom who's whose daughter, um, when she was pregnant with her daughter, this was about 10 years ago, she went to the doctor and the doctor told her that she was in the process of having um, uh, a miscarriage. And she said, I don't want to take this word, this report from the doctor. And she went to the church and she had uh, the elders of the church anoint her with oil and pray. And a a few weeks later, she went back to the doctor and 
and the doctor said, well, the baby is, is still there, but this baby will have uh, severe uh, disabilities, and she was encouraged to abort the pregnancy. And she said, I'm not going to do this. And she went back to the church, and the elders anointed her with oil again, and they prayed. And 10 years later, I actually met her daughter right when I was doing her mother's interview, a healthy, young, 10-year-old girl who loves art and was creating beautiful drawings as I was interviewing her mom. By prayer and petition, this lady named Tricia presented her request to God along with the church that cares for her, and God guarded her heart and her mind during that pregnancy and in her daughter's upbringing, and her daughter loves God just like her mom loves God, and her daughter's love for God is expressing its beauty through art and relationships, and it's just beautiful. And I know that doesn't happen in every situation, but what does happen in every situation if we truly allow God to be near us is that he will guard our hearts and minds with the peace that only he can bring. This is what Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi to do. In verse 8 he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Basically what Paul is saying here, if anything is of heaven, your true home, think about such things. This makes me think of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind is renewed by thought. Right now the Philippians didn't have this full 66 books of a book, but they had this letter. And they would repeat this letter out loud as the community would listen to it. And we get to read these letters in Scripture, these heavenly letters that were penned by man, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the things that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, that are admirable, excellent or praiseworthy. And Paul says, think about such things. Think about heaven. Dwell on the reality of your eternal home with God, is what Paul is writing there to the church in Philippi. I mean, in a situation in which they found themselves in suffering and persecution, it could be so easy to think about the other things going on in their world. But Paul says, no, no, no. Think about heaven. Think about Jesus. Think about what's good. Because when you think about what's good, you will be renewed. And when your mind is renewed, transformed into the image of Jesus, you can endure whatever comes. You can rejoice in the Lord if your mind is in the Lord and on the Lord. And in verse 9 he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the peace of God will be with you. This makes me think of Paul, what we talked about in Philippians chapter 3 and chapter 3 verse 17 when Paul writes, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Remember, there are enemies of the cross of Christ that are present in Philippi, false teachers proclaiming false gospels, Judaizers saying that it's Jesus plus the Mosaic law, Jesus plus circumcision that will get you life with God. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And you need to keep your eyes on people who think noble and pure and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy thoughts like we do. Because if you don't, you will be misled, misguided by those with bad intentions or false intentions. Okay, some blanks to fill in. Gratitude is the expression, but rejoicing is the exhortation of this letter. The phrase, in the Lord, holds the key to rejoicing in any and every situation. These commands are connected to the overall theme of the letter and situation of the church. I put reflection question, but I think this is going to be more of a rhetorical question. Have you ever met a mean Christian? (laughs) What What about a gentle Christian? Which interaction, I guess, which person seems to be more evident of one who is rejoicing in the Lord? 
A lot of mean Christians will rejoice, or I'm, not, I'm sorry, not rejoice. They will fixate their attention on the things around them that are broken or wrong or not going in their favor. <clears throat> but those who are joyful will fix their attention on Jesus. Their hearts and their minds are guided by God. Those are the ones that are joyful. Yeah, she's a wonderful girl. Girl, one of my one of my favorites graduating this year from Web City High School, going to Ozark. Right, that's the plan. Yeah, I'm sure Jason and Janice too spent a lot of time in, in prayer and, and going to God in that. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Any questions or thoughts on the first nine verses of chapter four? We're gonna make it, Roberta. Don't you worry. <laughs> oh man don't pass out all right philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 13 the the granddaddy of misquoted verses we're finally going to get to it paul says in philippians chapter 4 verse 10 i rejoiced greatly in the lord remember the theme of this letter is gratitude but the exhortation is rejoicing and paul is only teaching them what he practices I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Uh Uh-oh, did you catch that phrase again? He didn't rejoice in prison cells or shackles. He rejoiced in what? The Lord. That at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I would love to be able to know that secret, Mary. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, learned to be this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. He says it two times. I think he's rubbing it into me, Mary. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible scripture that I had written on, on the brim of my baseball hat in high school. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Unfortunately, I did not hit many home runs, so I did not understand what that Bible verse meant. But now I do because we've been studying Philippians together. We understand the historical context that Paul found himself in. We understand the literary context that comes before and we will here soon know what comes after the, this verse. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, which is the, the secret of contentedness in any situation. Right, Mary? It's rejoicing in the Lord no matter where you find yourself. And he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I genuinely want that. Like, I genuinely want that peace. To know that whatever happens, I can be content. And the phrase is important, in the Lord. In the Lord. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I need to make a note here. When Paul says plenty, he's not, th- he's not talking about mansions. He's probably not even talking about middle class. Paul is probably just talking about having basic food, shelter, and water is what Paul is talking about when he says plenty. Paul is a man, if not of anything, he is a man of moderation. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then he blows the secret. I can do all of this through Christ who gives me strength. We can only rejoice in hard circumstances because we're rejoicing in the Lord. We can only endure in in little or in plenty because we can endure in the Lord, in Christ who gives us strength. I love that the NIV has changed their translation of this verse because it used to say, I can do all things through him who gives me strength, which is a fine translation, but that's why I thought I could hit home runs. You know what I'm saying? I can do all things. I can hit home runs, not with my puny 140-pound body back in high school. No way. I hit two. Don't want to brag, but I hit two. So, no big deal. (laughs) What? T-ball. So, (laughs) just kidding. 
No, hit two, Dan. Hit two. My, my team cheered embarrassingly loud when I, when I hit those home runs, too. Most everybody else was just hitting home runs on the, on the regular. Not Drake. Not Drake. But to be serious, this, this verse and other verses like this in Scripture, when taken out of context, have done uh, great harm. Mine is just a silly example. I mean, I really would have loved to have hit more home runs, but it wasn't all that big of a deal. I just genuinely thought, because nobody taught me differently, that this verse, I could apply it in that way. But that's not what Paul applied this verse to. That's not why he wrote these words. He wrote these words to say, I can endure this pain this imprisonment. I can endure this sufferings. I can endure this trial. I can endure this being apart from you, those that I love, because I'm doing it in Christ. I think Paul would have just smiled at me and winked when he thought, when I was thinking that I could hit home runs, because that's not at all what this, this is talking about. And the secret here is being in Christ. <laughs> a few verses, or a few fill in the blanks, Context is extremely important. Verses taken out of context can deal great harm when applied out of context. The next one is this should prompt us to reflect on the grip materialism might have in our life. Materialism. Materialism is one of the greatest gods of the American culture. The desire for more. More food, more space, more toys, more equipment, bigger, better. We are a culture of advancement, and not just in medicine and education. We are, we are an upgrade culture, right? Not a downgrade culture. The only time we downgrade is when we're forced to downgrade because we've lost a job or maybe we have an empty nest. That is one reason people downgrade, right? Not me. I got two little ones. This is my third shirt of the day, by the way. Not because of materialism, but because my eighth month old spit up on me. And then my two-year-old had guacamole for dinner, and I didn't know he had it on his shirt. Then I was laying down, playing with the eight-month-old. He came over to wrestle me all down the front of my shirt. Uh, the second shirt, he put guacamole on me, so I had to change. This is my third shirt. Not materialism, just babies, okay? Just babies. So, exactly. You were judging me, weren't you, Mary? Man, wow, okay. I want to read a few comments from commentaries. Paul's abundance here would have been a meager and simple by modern standards. Artisans were better off than the poor, but far below the standards of a living enjoyed by the modern Western middle class or by the well-to-do of antiquity. Paul was not a rich man. He was a man who was actually having to fund his own imprisonment. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 is how we know that Paul was in uh, prison under house arrest in Rome for two years. And in that, we are see that he has to pay for his own imprisonment. And remember, I told you, I think that, I think I told you guys this earlier in the, in the, in the course. Rome was not required to uh, pay for your food or your, well, your, your medicine or whatever you needed when you were on house arrest. Your friends or your family had to pay for that. Now, Paul's friends and family were all back in the Jerusalem area. They're all back in Israel. And so it was people like Epaphroditus who was sent by Philippi and believers there in Rome who were taking care of him, doing his Walmart pickup for him. Paul was not a man of great wealth. Finally, coming directly after verse 9, as it does, the language and length of this passage is this, that it also serves as a final moment in this letter. He has just urged them not to be anxious about anything, but to leave their situation in God's care, who as the God of peace will keep their hearts and minds in Christ. Paul now models and what that means, that in Christ one can truly know contentment in any and all circumstances. That is the only way to truly know contentment is in Christ. In Christ. Okay, any questions on that section? Roberta, we are going to make it. We're going to finish. Especially since nobody's asking questions. Do what? That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to leave you guys. The, I'm not even going to say the last blank. So, we have to come back next week, even though there's no class. All right, Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. Two more passages to go. Paul writes to them and he says, It was good of you to share in my troubles. 
Now let me, let, me, let me back up and connect these two passages before I really start reading. He said, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. The Philippian church, as you know, has been a supporter of Paul's ministry and a caretaker of Paul while he is in prison. Paul is, say, Paul is not saying, hey, I don't need you. But it kind of is at the same time. Because in Christ, Paul can have everything. But in Christ, wait a second, who's in Christ? The believers in Philippi. The family of believers. Paul knows it's actually God taking care of him. But God is meeting his needs through those who are in Christ. Those who are believers in Jesus. And they have sent their dear friend Epaphroditus to Rome to be with Paul during this imprisonment. And he says, yes, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, think Acts chapter 16, Lydia, the jailer, and his family. In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, because of the man in the vision, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. This is an interesting, verse 17. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Which is how we would say it today. I want more jewels on your crown when you get to heaven. This is the promise of reward for those who sacrifice. This is the last will be first sort of language. These believers have not, Paul knows that God can take care of him however God wants to take care of them. But the Philippians have been obedient in caring for a brother in need. And he says, not that I desire your gifts. I'm sure he appreciated them. But what he desires is that more be credited to the account of the church there in Philippi. That they are filled with more joy and more peace and that they will be rewarded in eternity because of their love for their brother in need. That's what he's saying in verse 17. I have received full payment and have more than enough. Hmm. I am amply supplied. <laughs> this man is chained to a guard and he's saying these words. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. We don't exactly know the gifts that were sent. They may have been practical things. Um, like utensils, they may have been um, things like mementos from earlier visits that Paul had. He had two, at least, that we know of in Philippi. We're just not exactly sure. But he says of them, they are a fragrant offering. This is, man, they're a beautiful candle. It smells good. Makes the whole sense of the room pleasing. An acceptable sacrifice. Pleasing to God. Catch that word, an acceptable sacrifice sacrifice. Paul uses that word, I think, intentionally. This is a group of believers who sent a gift with Epaphroditus to him, and this, because of this sacrifice, is why he desires more to be credited to their account, for they have sacrificed for the sake of a brother in need. And it is pleasing to God. Why is it pleasing to God? Think Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In the same way, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. He sacrificed. And that is pleasing to God when you sacrifice for others, for God's glory and the good of other people. And then Paul says in chapter, or sorry, verse 19, and my God will meet all of your needs. What? So these people are sacrificing greatly even though they have needs? Remember materialism as being one of the big gods in America? I'm going to store things up for myself. Not so in Philippi. They had needs and they still sent things to serve their brother rather than looking to their own interest. They are the example of how Paul has encouraged them to live. Remember, these le this letter, like we just talked about, is not a rebuke. It is an exhortation to continue to do what they have already been doing. And when they do so, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
talking about riches is a man imprisoned in Rome writing to a group of Christians who would have been persecuted because of their faith proclaiming a new empire in Philippi, one that has been a land that has been dominated by empire after empire. These people are not rich financially, but they know what awaits them and is currently present available to them in Christ Jesus. Riches of his glory. Something that is not specific because it cannot truly be named because of how great it is. And it's great because it's in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Then Paul writes in verse 20, to our God and Father. Notice the switch from verse 19 to 20, my God. He also knows that it's their God as well, to our God and Father. Be glory forever and ever Amen. Let it be. Hmm. A couple of notes to fill in. Paul hasn't forgotten what happened a decade ago. It's been a decade since Acts chapter 16 when he ran into Lydia down by the river. I'm sure you can fill this one in by yourself, but who is the one who truly meets all needs? It is God. But God often meets our needs through other people who make sacrifices for us. Two more verses, Lindsay, and we're done with the whole letter. Roberta didn't think we were going to finish. She has been bringing it up constantly. She's like, I don't think we're going to finish, Drake. I'm just kidding. (laughs) All right, two more verses. You guys want to save it for next week? Philippians chapter 4, verse 21 and 22 and 23. This is a benediction. This is something that Paul typically includes in his letters that he writes to churches or to persons. This is the closing statement, if you will. Remember when we talked week one, I said that the way in which they started a letter is different than how we would start a letter. Actually, how they start a letter is typically how we would end a letter with mentioning who the person writing the letter is. Paul starts with it because this letter would have been read to a community of believers, to the church there in Philippi. So he started with his name, Paul and Timothy, the authors of this letter. Remember that this letter is still being read. I know we studied it over five weeks, Jim over one. But, uh, I'm just kidding, Jim, I love you, man. Jim's probably going to go with me to Papua New Guinea in March, hopefully, you know. Hope we don't get mosquito bites. Um, anyways, what were we talking about this letter? We've been studying it over five weeks. They would have had it a session maybe of 15 minutes of reading, something like that. I don't know if people were asking questions in the middle of it. You guys didn't, so they probably didn't either, but... Uh, this, is, this is concluding the reading of the letter for the church there in Philippi. And before we read it, I know some of you guys have already probably skipped ahead and read it because I'm taking so long, I'm dragging this out, aren't I? I have at least 13 more minutes. Think about everything they've heard so far. They would have known the context. They would have heard throughout this letter that they were Paul's joy multiple times. He prays with joy when he thinks of them. They would have been exhorted by Paul to continue in the work of the gospel, no matter the circumstances. They would have been called by Paul to endure in Christ, no matter. In fact, more than endure, this is more than a a bearing of the pain or the suffering or the persecution. This is a call to rejoice in everything. Well, I'm sorry, not in everything, in Christ, in the midst of everything. They would have been called to sacrifice for their brothers and sisters in their relationships with one another. They would have been called to have the same mindset as Jesus. And they would have been reminded that Jesus did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So whatever status they possessed, they would not have been to use it to their own advantage, but to serve one another humbly in love. They would have been reminded about the false teachings that came about in their land and in other lands that they would have heard about. People saying that it's Christ plus. Paul said, no, it's Christ, for he alone is sufficient. No work of man, unless it is the God-man, can save your soul. 
They would have been called to keep their eyes on things like people like Paul and Epaphroditus and Timothy. People who loved God and weren't in it for themselves. They would have been called to keep their minds on things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Called to think about those things. This is what the church has just endured, I'm guessing, with great gratitude and joy for the past 15 minutes. And these are the last few sentences that he writes. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. Why does he say that to do that? Because remember, these are brothers and sisters. Anyone who is in Jesus is a brother or sister. <laughs> Speaking of brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters who are with me, well, they send greetings. Those people would have been the Roman Christians. They would have been Timothy it would have been Epaphroditus who probably would have been present at that. He was probably the person who carried this letter back. In fact, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now, we'll talk about Caesar's household for a second, but I want you not to miss this. Everything that Paul has talked to them about in this letter that I just reviewed for us, there are people not just in Philippi, but all over this map who are enduring the same things, who are being called to the same kind of rejoicing in the Lord, contentment in the Lord, perseverance in the Lord. They are family, not by the blood that runs through their veins, but by the blood that covers them in Christ Jesus. And especially in this early age of the church, they needed one another. And so Paul, not just Paul, Everyone sends their greetings because there is a community of believers throughout this known world who loves Jesus. And because they love Jesus, they want to love and serve other people, just like the church in Philippi. I'm sure if they had Zoom back in that day, this part of the letter wouldn't have been necessary to write. But I think at the end of the letter, they may have had the names of people, traveling ministers, people that they would have heard stories of in sermons. I bet they would have had their names on their mind as they would have heard of these greetings. The church is a family. And Paul uses so much familial language in this letter. He wants them to know that they are loved. Let's talk about Caesar's household. I said in week chapter 2 that prison house arrest was not Paul's ideal setting for ministry. He was a traveling missionary. He would go from city to city to proclaim the gospel, debate in synagogues and in places of education. He would have conversations with all kinds of people proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. He was a mover and a shaker. He would have had so many airline miles if he was alive today. This was Paul's favorite type of ministry. And for two years, he was in a prison apartment being taken care of by his friends in the Roman church and Timothy and Epaphroditus. And he says, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And this is speculation. It's part wonder. It's part hope. But Caesar's household refers to people who were in the civil service of Caesar. Remember, this was Caesar's special unit of elite soldiers. And the people that Paul was chained to for 24-7, 365 times 2, because I'm bad at math. I can't do 365 times 2 in a group of people. Over 700 days. I do know that. Maybe, just maybe, People came to Christ. These men, Praetorian Guard, Palace Guard, came to Christ. And although they have to guard this prisoner, maybe, just maybe, he's now their pastor. And they send their greetings to the church in Philippi. I want to read from Philippians chapter 1, where Paul talks about this preaching. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains 
for Christ. Maybe, just maybe, although it's speculation, wonder, and hope, there's no detail given, but maybe, just maybe, that that verse in Philippians chapter 1 and this verse here at the end of Philippians chapter 4 are indicating, and maybe they know details that we don't, maybe it's indicating that some of those men that Paul was chained to became believers in Jesus. And now they're brothers and sisters of a group of people, not in Rome, but in little Rome, a city called Philippi. I don't know, but I hope so. Verse 23, Philippians chapter 4. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in your spirit. Amen. And that's the letter. There's some blanks though, and I know you need to fill them out or it'll drive you crazy. The brothers and sisters with Paul are Roman Christians. Those who belong to Caesar's household could refer to the praetorian or palace guard. Speculation, wonder, and hope. Paul's chains have served to advance the gospel. Think Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 through 13. Hmm. Now to end our time because we do have a little bit of time left. Roberta didn't think I would finish, but we did. She's always hating on me, that Roberta. I want you to talk at your table, not necessarily what you have learned, but how you've been encouraged by this letter in your own life. If I were to answer the question, it would be from Philippians chapter 4. I, can, I want to learn the secret of being content no matter the situation. No matter if I'm on a double income, no kids like I was two years ago, or if I'm about to go to one income, two kids here in a few months. You know what I'm saying? I want to know the secret, man, to being content. Because I used to have plenty, <laughs> and now I might not have as much. And, and inflation, you know. I just need to know the secret, Paul. And I guess it's in Christ. So at your tables, if you would, for a few minutes, talk about how this letter has formed you in the image of Christ more than when we started five weeks ago for some of us, 45 minutes ago for Jim. All right. Ricky, you can't defer to Dan either. <laughs> he is brutal, man. He's mean.
All right. I would love to hear some answers. Can we start at this table? Either of you willing to share how this letter, this class, has uh, helped you in your formation of Christ? Hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. You want to share anything? For, for, there you go. You and Ricky, man, deferring all the time. Dan, you want to defer to Ricky or you want to answer? <laughs> yeah? Generational brokenness, yep. Middle table in the back, the rebel rousers of the class. <laughs> Roberta's like, hurry up. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> I appreciate you sharing, Jody. This table, anybody want to share? Right. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Table number one. I don't know why you're number one, but yeah. Uh. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 I even thought about that. That's a great insight. That's a great insight. Thanks, Sharon. Well, guys, thank you guys for being such a, a great class. There's been a voracious voracious note takers in this class too way more than the high school kids I'll tell you that much right now uh, that was exciting to see people engage and not tweeting or snapchatting um, but you know you know this like I do this is more than a class this is a this is a community a little colony of heaven here on earth just like in Philippi and uh, I would just encourage you uh, with this information that we have from the book of uh, Philippi remember that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit it's not a textbook 
It's not just a letter that found our way, uh, its way to our mailbox. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has been illuminating it for us in the study, helping us understand uh, what life in Christ is like, and I would encourage you to keep reading it. Uh, you now know a lot of the context of this letter, and so I would encourage you to read it uh, even by yourself or with your family or your friends, um, and continue to grow in Christ. And um, just very, very grateful. And I would love to offer up a word of prayer before we uh, end our time together. Father, I'm grateful for uh, this group of people who showed up so regularly over the past five weeks. And even anybody uh, who is not able to be here tonight and those people who were joining us uh, from the live stream and on the podcast. Very grateful uh, for the desire to study uh, the the word of the Lord. Father, would would you bless our minds and transform our minds? Father, with letters like Philippians, help us to think about these these matters, because these matters are what Paul wrote about in in chapter 4, admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. These are things worth thinking about. These are heavenly things. So, Father, as we think about these things, would you transform our minds to become more like yours? Father, thank you for this community of believers. Would you bless them and their families? Would you bless um, those who are married in their marriages? Would you bless those with children in their parenting. Uh, Father, would you bless their engagement here at church, whether it's in classes like this one or in the worship services or in small groups or in serving. Uh, Father, just grateful for this group of people. And may this this group of people be a blessing, the kind of blessing that uh, Paul thought the Philippian church was. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you next year. That was a long time to commit to not seeing you guys.